Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. And I'm Andrew Chang. Tonight, where Canada sits in the race to get people vaccinated. We're waiting for our instructions. We're ready to go. The logistics, the dosages, and the example being set abroad. They're telling us one thing and then doing the other. The cost of holiday travel goes up for some politicians in Alberta. I haven't been able to really get any work done. What parents can expect as some provinces head back to school. And U.S. politics begins 2021 with a bang. Working the phones to subvert American democracy for his personal benefit. Let that sink in for a minute. What's at stake in the next 48? This is The Nation. Well, this wildfire of a pandemic continues to rage, with Canada to date surpassing 600,000 confirmed cases, and the virus still picking up speed. And vaccines could be the fire break, but only if vaccinations can run down the racing virus. So far in Canada, that is not happening. Across most of the West, case rates are stable, but they're high. In Ontario and Quebec, the pandemic is accelerating. Overall, Canada detected 7,911 cases to date. That is a pace Canada's vaccine rollout struggles to match. Public health experts and leaders themselves acknowledge it's all happening too slowly, but Briar Stewart shows us speeding up vaccinations is a bit of a New Year's resolution for officials across the country. Anita, how are you? Good to see you. After facing criticism around a slow rollout, Ontario officials say it's now full steam ahead. We're ramping it up and you're going to see a significant difference over the next uh, few weeks there. Some working on the front lines have called it maddening that tens of thousands of doses are sitting in freezers when long-term care home residents are dying from COVID-19. We have people who've raised their hand and said, we will do this 24-7, engage us please, and we're waiting for our instructions. We're ready to go. We just don't know what, you know, what's causing the delays. Across the country, provinces vow to pick up the pace. In Manitoba, healthcare workers lined up at a convention center turned mass vaccination site. The province hopes to administer 10,000 vaccines a week by the end of the month. I'm very excited. I'm hopeful more of the population can get access to the vaccine so that maybe there is an end in sight to this. In British Columbia, the hope is to have 150,000 people vaccinated by the end of February. It's a monumental task and it's, uh, there are many months left to go in this. Like elsewhere, health care workers, long-term care residents and remote First Nations are the priority here. Last week, dozens were vaccinated on the Gitgat First Nation, which is a northern community on BC's coast. The fact that we've been able to have access to the vaccine, been able to give it to the majority of people eligible, it creates a bit of a sense of relief, feel a little bit safer. But for some Canadians who have received the vaccine, there's still uncertainty around the timeline for the next round. Quebec is delaying giving some their second shot in order to give more people at least one dose now. It's disappointing for some families. I was so hopeful and so excited about being able to hug my dad. And now that there's a delay in the delivery of the vaccine, I can't say that. So, Briar, do any of these plans to ramp up involve expanding vaccinations beyond those priority groups? Well, Adrian, the provinces are really still trying to nail down just when and how the vaccine will be available to the general public. And NBC, Dr. Bonnie Henry says that's because they're still waiting to hear exactly how many doses they'll receive this spring. She added that if Ottawa approves more vaccines, like the AstraZeneca one, it would help with the rollout and with the federal government's target of having all Canadians give access to the vaccine by September. All right, Breyer, thanks very much. Breyer Stewart in Vancouver. So we know supply is the dominant issue here with this vaccine. But as Christine Burak shows us, delaying a person's second dose is just one of several ideas. Governments are weighing to stretch a limited precious resource. Is it a risk worth taking? To double its vaccine supply, the U.S. is considering whether to give Americans just two half doses of Moderna's COVID vaccine. In a normal time, we would never do that. Clearly, these aren't normal times. We asked experts whether it's safe and effective to go off-label, give people vaccines in ways they weren't studied, including two half doses. It may be totally fine, and it may be the most intelligent decision people have ever made, 
or it might be a mistake. But he adds it's not clear whether two half doses would protect people as long as two full doses. Another scenario Canadians might face, getting two different vaccines. The Public Health Agency of Canada left the door open to the interchangeability of mRNA vaccines like Moderna and Pfizer in case of limited supply or unavailability. But does it make sense to mix and match similar vaccines? We don't normally mix vaccines because we, you know, you, you just don't have the data. But uh, it's not that hard to get the data. She adds studies are ongoing. Right now, there is enough supply to offer high-risk groups two doses of the same vaccine. But while Ontario is giving healthcare workers their second doses, the message in Quebec and several provinces is that their second dose could be delayed by several months. Some experts say, based on the data they've seen, that may be okay. But we also need to be open to the way that they were studied is not necessarily the best way to use them in the middle of a pandemic. It's not wrong to kick the tires of any strategy. You should be kicking the tires. Um, it's just when you go that off-label, all bets are off. Some say, given the number of lives at stake, some risks are worth taking. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Conservative Senator Don Platt is the latest to come under fire after vacationing abroad during the holidays. The pandemic has forced us to change some of those traditions since we cannot travel and gather as we normally would. So that was Platt on December 17th describing the effects of COVID-19 on holiday tri travel. The Manitoba senator then flew to Mexico on December 28th. He returned on New Year's Eve and is now self-isolating. But it's really elected politicians who've been stirring public anger as word has spread about their holiday travel. Some have been demoted, but never so many as today in Alberta. Aaron Collins shows us what pushed the premier to get tough. In a Twitter video this summer, Jason Kenney encouraged Albertans to vacation at home. So please embrace 2020 as the year of the Alberta staycation. The Premier joined in the video by his then tourism minister. While travel outside the province is not recommended at this time. But Tanya Fur and at least five other Conservative MLAs ignored that advice. Vacationing outside Canada over Christmas, trips Jason Kenney defended when news of them broke. I don't think it's, it's reasonable uh, for, for me as, as a leader to sanction people who uh, very carefully followed the public health orders and the legal requirements. Included in the list of jet-setting MLAs, the Minister of Municipal Affairs. She was in Hawaii. Other MLAs traveled to Arizona and Mexico. All of that as the government asked Albertans to stay home over the holidays. They're telling us one thing and then doing the other, which I think is definitely unfair for us. It's embarrassing uh, to watch. I didn't see my family at Christmas and politicians are on vacation. Today, Jason Kenney responded to that public outrage on Facebook, accepting the resignation of one minister and demoting the five other traveling MLAs. Too little, too late for the opposition. I've never seen such widespread and intense public anger in Alberta in my life. Adding to that anger, Jason Kenney's chief of staff flew to England for the holidays. He has also resigned, and Kenney says he was unaware of any of the foreign travel, something this former deputy premier finds hard to believe. Uh, for premier not to know where his chief of staff is and where he's holidaying and whom he's meeting with even on the holidays is, is just uh, impossible to believe. Back in July, when that staycation video was posted, just 33 Albertans were in hospital due to COVID-19. Today, that number is over 900. Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. Some others paid a price today for holiday trips. Joe Hargrave stepped down from the Saskatchewan cabinet for going to California right before Christmas to finalize a house sale. And Conservative MP David Sweet resigned as chair of the Ethics Committee for a trip to the U.S., and said he won't seek re-election. Last week, two Liberal MPs were demoted, also an NDP member, and Ontario's finance minister resigned from that post.
Now, one consequence of international travel showed up in Ontario today. Three more confirmed cases, bringing the total to six of the coronavirus variant the UK has struggled with. All three of the new cases have traveled or have had close contact with someone who traveled outside of the country. Ontario's new daily case count is once again over 3,200. Clearly, the biggest issue isn't travel, but rather community spread. And the province is approaching a new milestone, with the seven-day average of new cases edging towards 3,000. Now, it all does raise the question where precisely the spread is happening, particularly in a lockdown. And today, Toronto said it will start releasing information on outbreaks in the workplace. Aaron Saltzman has that. In the midst of a lockdown, Toronto still reported nearly a thousand new cases of COVID-19 today. Now the city is taking a closer look at where people are still working. It does continue to be a source of transmission for COVID-19. After healthcare settings, community and workplaces are the second largest source of COVID-19 outbreaks in Toronto. But there's almost no information about which workplaces may be large sources of transmission, either because it's not known or not made public. So the city says it will gather and publish that data itself. Toronto will break down workplaces into 11 specific categories, including food processing, warehousing, shipping and distribution, and manufacturing. Businesses will also have to disclose when they have two or more COVID cases, and if they meet certain criteria, those specific workplaces will be publicly named. I think that is excellent public health leadership. This epidemiologist says industrial settings can be high risk, and workplaces need to be tracked more closely. Any time a public health unit goes off on its own to issue orders, to uh, set policy, it's doing it to fill a vacuum. The province should be absolutely right on top of that. It should have been from the beginning. Others also say there's only so much the city can do. Unfortunately, their whole uh, strategy is dependent on employers coming forward to report themselves, basically. The province, she says, needs to step up workplace inspections and provide paid sick leave for the minimum wage, often part-time temporary workers still on the job and less likely to take time off should they get COVID-19. That is who Toronto says it's trying to help. Those essential frontline workers who have often been at the greatest risk. And until they're protected, he says, COVID will keep spreading. Aaron Saltzman, CBC News, Toronto. Schools are another concern as cases climb. Today, Alberta, Manitoba, Quebec and Ontario switched their in-class students to online learning for at least a week. As Deanna Sumnak-Johnson tells us, for many families, holiday rest just turned into sudden school stress. Mommy's going to help you with your work, okay? Helping her seven and nine year old kids with online learning is tough, even for this university professor. I think having a full day of sitting in front of a computer was a lot more challenging um, than I was, maybe I was expecting. It was a pretty rough start. Alberta and Ontario are two of the provinces that temporarily moved classes online after the holidays. For parents whose kids normally attend school in person, a day of adjustments. I haven't been able to really get any work done because his he's not quite computer savvy enough to be signing himself into different platforms. This family gave their six-year-old son his mother's work computer after he couldn't access the school's online platform on the iPad. We are for sure buying a computer so that he can have a full setup for him. So buying a computer. And it will be one day at a time. And blocking time, yeah, right? We, block right. Our we, have to, we have to block time. So I will probably work tonight. Teachers who are parents themselves are facing special challenges. Many had to pivot quickly to teaching online, often while assisting their own kids with online learning. Many of us have been calling for uh, the government to uh, provide essential daycare spots uh, for many uh, uh, educators and educational staff. Uh, who now find themselves in a position of having to fulfill their professional responsibilities without any daycare uh, access. A larger question looms for many families. Will schools be closed beyond this week? According to the education ministers for Alberta and Ontario, there are no plans for that. Deanna Sumanak-Johnson, CBC News, Toronto.
Well, Quebec has become the latest province to approve the NHL's return to play plan. It's the third to do so after Alberta and B.C., leaving Manitoba and Ontario as the only jurisdictions that have not yet announced a final decision. The news comes as teams across the league hit the ice for a shortened training camp with the season set to start next Wednesday. Tournament. And another shutout tonight for a standout Canadian as the defending World Damn. Junior Champs continue to steamroll the competition in Edmonton. Russia was their latest victim with Canada cruising to a 5-0 win in today's semifinal. They'll now play for gold tomorrow night. An important election in Georgia tomorrow will decide who controls the U.S. Senate. But what are Americans talking about today? That phone call in which Donald Trump pressured Georgia officials to find votes for him in November's presidential election. Katie Simpson has the fallout from Washington. The president's brazen attempt to hold on to power appears to be energizing his supporters. There's no way we lost Georgia. There's no way. The rigged, that was a rigged election. At a rally to promote Republican candidates in tomorrow's Senate runoff elections, he showed no signs of regretting his actions, despite widespread condemnation. An American president sitting in the Oval Office, working the phones to subvert American democracy for his personal benefit. Let that sink in for a minute. This call was not uh, a helpful call. I just think it's inappropriate. In that hour-long phone call on Saturday, Donald Trump pressured and threatened Georgia's elections officials to overturn the results of the November vote, citing conspiracy theories about widespread voter fraud to make his case. All I want to do is this. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes, which is one more that we have. The man who oversees Georgia's elections used the spotlight yes, to meticulously debunk the false information the president continues to peddle, especially after what he heard on that call. I wanted to scream. At, well, I did scream at the computer and I screamed in my car. Republicans fear the infighting is undermining public confidence in the election system at a crucial time. Voters in Georgia are about to determine which party will control the U.S. Senate in a pair of close runoff elections tomorrow. My sole focus is on getting Georgians out to vote on January 5th because we are the firewall to stopping socialism. For the Republican candidates, Trump's call is another unwanted distraction, forcing them off message, presenting a fresh opportunity for Democrats. One state can chart the course, not just for the next four years, but for the next generation. Okay, some pretty big implications clearly there, Katie. A, a lot going on in the U.S. this week. What should we be zoning in on? The Georgia Senate elections are tomorrow, but it could take a couple of days to count all the votes and actually get a result. Back here in Washington, Congress will meet to certify the results of the presidential election on Wednesday. Some Republicans are trying to block this, but it's not expected to work. What to really be aware of is what happens outside. Donald Trump supporters, including members of the Proud Boys, are expected to be in town for a protest. The National Guard has been activated because of fears of violence. And the mayor put out an unusual statement warning people not to bring their guns because it's illegal here in D.C. Okay, thank you, Katie. Katie Simpson, senior correspondent in Washington. So that upside down edge of the cliff feeling in the United States, clearly that's not over. We will have more on what's at stake this week when I speak with author Tom Nichols later in the show. Well, a national address from the British Prime Minister tonight. The government is once again instructing you to stay at home. Next, a new lockdown in England and a grim warning about the weeks ahead. We look abroad for ideas that could see more Canadians vaccinated sooner. Taking an all-hands-on-deck approach is really important. Plus, a family reunion for a COVID vaccine. The closest that I've been to my mom throughout the whole pandemic. A moment between mother and son. We're back in two. Well, the variant of the coronavirus originating in the UK, thought to be more contagious, sparked tough new measures there today. The Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, has ordered England into lockdown until the middle of next month. Farah Morali tells us more. It was a morning of optimism in the UK. 82-year-old Brian Pinker became the first person to receive the newly approved 
Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. The vaccine means everything for me. I mean, it, to my mind, it's, it's the only way of getting back to a bit of normal life. But by evening, reality sank in. It's been both frustrating and alarming to see the speed with which the new variant is spreading. In England, we must therefore go into a national lockdown which is tough enough to contain this variant. That means the government is once again instructing you to stay at home. The new lockdown will look a lot like the one in March, with people asked to stay at home and only go out to shop for essential items. Schools too will close. It comes after the UK recorded more than 50,000 new COVID cases for the seventh day in a row. That's putting intense pressure on hospitals. Staff here at London St George's Hospital have had to double their capacity to supply oxygen. Quite a lot of those people haven't been older, older people. They haven't been people with lots of medical problems. They have been young and fit people who have been themselves shocked at how unwell they've gotten. England isn't alone. With infections rising in Scotland, it too goes into lockdown tomorrow. Our fundamental advice for everyone is to stay at home. The Prime Minister says they're pushing ahead with vaccinations across the UK, saying every jab is tilting the odds against COVID. But the weeks ahead will be the hardest yet. Farah Morali, CBC News, London. Now, another variant is causing concern in South Africa, with officials worried it might prove to be more resistant to current vaccines. The variant that has been identified has got at least three, mutant, uh, three mutations, which could potentially impact on uh, the antibody that's induced by the vaccine. Now, experts say it is unlikely that the mutation in South Africa would make the current vaccines useless, but might weaken its impact. There's no evidence, though, that the mutations have made the virus deadlier. It has been almost a month since the first vaccine was approved for use in Canada. That felt fast. The vaccination program, though, has been sluggish. So how does it get faster? Where are the good ideas around the world that Canada can maybe borrow? Well, let's start with a report card. As of this week, the countries that have vaccines, the world average was 0.17 shots per 100 people. Now, Canada fared a little better, 0.31, not as good as the United States and certainly not as good as the global leader, Israel, which has already vaccinated 14 out of every 100 people. How are they doing that? The country is small. Well, that helps with getting shots in arms. But Palestinians in Gaza and the occupied West Bank still don't have access to the vaccine. That is a worry. When it comes to Israeli citizens, though, they are being vaccinated faster than anyone else in the world. There are drive-through vaccinations. Some clinics run 24-7. There are enough ideas at work to intrigue Canadian Dr. Tara Kieran, a leader in medical innovation. Paramedics are one of the groups that they have um, uh, co-opted to help them to deliver the vaccine. I think in Canada, there's been, you know, this focus really on relying on our nurses who are already very stretched due to COVID-19. And I think that taking an all hands on deck approach is really important. Digitized medical records in Israel mean notifications of appointments are online or by text. Canada is not ready for that. When I went to get a, a flu vaccine at the pharmacy, I actually have no idea how my family doctor found out or if she ever found out that I did. What happens in this country? Unfortunately, uh, much of healthcare still runs on faxes. It is still done via fax, uh, believe it or not. The Israeli government approach is strong, but vaccine hesitancy is still stubborn, a phenomenon approached differently around the world. So in Spain, people can refuse vaccines, but a registry of refusals will be shared with the EU. The consequences of that aren't yet clear. Italy's idea is to make a vaccination more like an event, planning beautiful pavilions for vaccine distribution, all marked with a primrose, the first flower of spring. I love that, that approach of um, connecting this idea of getting immunized to doing something good for yourself and the world, to rebirth, if you will, uh, to spring. Physician Noah Ivers is with the Canadian coalition called 19 to Zero, aiming to curate the best ideas to counter COVID and vaccine hesitancy. The research shows that two things uh, can uh, be most effective at addressing vaccine hesitancy. Number one, 
is advice from a trusted uh, religious organization or leader. And number two is advice from a trusted healthcare professional. I say thank you, I say a blessing to God. To see this rabbis vaccinated and imams encouraging it helps. From Islamic law standpoint, it is absolutely fine and permissible to take medicine to prevent a disease. Persuasion matters, Ivor says, but broadly, this all has to be about speed. Maybe folks need a ride to the clinic. I think we can steal a lot from successful get the vote out campaigns in that regard. We need to collate the lists of folks willing to work off hours, middle of the night. The plea from health workers is if Canada wants to do better, it needs to approach vaccinating people like a disaster deployment. Because sadly, that's what it is. Hmm. So, so you mentioned, Adrian, Israel is moving mm -hmm. quickly. How quickly? Okay, uh, so for some perspective, you heard British Columbia talk about maybe 150,000 by February. Right. Uh, Israel vaccinated 150,000 people last Thursday. Hmm. So this is about a, a mindset, it's about infrastructure, it's about setting a huge target and then an urgent deadline. They've got pop-up vaccination centres, they're recruiting anyone who is available and th there really is, like, it, it's that thought process that they're really hoping countries like Canada start to absorb. Very interesting. Okay, uh, next, as some kids head back to school, parents have questions. If elementary school teachers are considered essential workers, how come they have not been prioritized to receive the vaccine? So hey, we called in the doctors to answer that and much more right after the break. And later, a vaccine shot that is a family affair, a moment between mother and son in tonight's moment. Welcome back. With the holidays now over, lots of kids have headed back to school, as we know, but the rules for going back, very different across the country, right? Students are physically back in school today in British Columbia, in New Brunswick, Newfoundland, Labrador, the Northwest Territories, Yukon, parts of Nunavut, while some kids in Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Ontario will be doing virtual learning for at least another week in Quebec, Nova Scotia, and Prince Edward Island. The winter break was extended with the return to school delayed altogether. So. Why such different approaches and how does a vaccine play into schools being this uh, touch and go, so to speak? Infectious diseases specialist Dr. Susie Hoda and Dr. Lisa Barrett joining us now to uh, help us answer some of those questions. Dr. Hoda, uh, maybe I'll start with you. I, can you help me understand the logic of those cities and those school boards keeping kids home longer after this holiday break? Because I, I, I thought we decided that the risk of going back to school was pretty low back in September and the benefit was high. So, so what are we really accomplishing here? Well, I think there are a couple of things. First of all, I think people agree that the benefits of going back to in-person school are high and that virtual learning is not optimal for a lot of people. Um, but whether or not the risk is low in schools is a bit more complicated to answer. And some of that depends on what the epidemiology is of that location. So I think what we're dealing with is in some areas, um, you know, the city had been in lockdown or the region had been in lockdown uh, going into the holidays, but case counts were still continuing to rise quite rapidly. So the one thing that was not included in those lockdown measures was school closures. So a temporary closure um, is attempted to try and get those cases under control. Mm -hmm. and, and on the flip side, I mean, there, there are many districts where kids are going back to physical school as planned. And, you know, it really depends on what part of Canada you live in. So, Dr. Barrett, uh, this question is one that we received recently. Is it a good idea to let kids go back to school with hundreds of other people, especially considering, I mean, we, we don't yet know to what extent people gathered over the holidays, right? That's absolutely true. In certain areas, particularly places where people have gone back to school in person, their cases have been a little lower and that was part of their justification for sending kids back to school. And we may see some additional cases from holiday gatherings. However, hopefully there's enough testing that we were able to get to the uh, to, to know that there are more cases fairly quickly. The other side of that is, that kids are going back to school, but we're not taking away all of the precautions that were there. So let's not forget that even though it's in-person learning, this is not back to pre-pandemic business as usual. There are still lots of precautions in place to help reduce the risk of infection within the schools. Right. And so is it a good idea? Well, 
it's going to be a good idea from that idea that Dr. Hoda just mentioned that yes, we know the benefit is high. And if we keep a very careful, careful eye on what's happening in the community, uh, then we should be doing okay. Dr. Hoda, I'll give you this next one. Uh, it's a question we received from Evelyn in Hamilton, Ontario. I'm wondering if we assume that the vaccine can prevent transmission, which I understand we don't know right now, if kids can't get the vaccine, if all adults who can get the vaccine do, will that be enough to achieve herd, herd immunity and protect the kids? So, so this is such a good question, right? And, and I realize that herd immunity is not like a light switch, right? That you just turn on and off. But, but how do you approach that question? Well, if we're talking about herd immunity in its classic sense, you really have to get a really high vaccine coverage in the entire population to get to that point where you can indirectly protect other people who are not vaccinated. I'm not sure we could really achieve that just without vaccinating um, children, but just focusing on adults. And we don't know what the uptake will be uh, entirely in the adult population, too. But what it can do if we really push forward with vaccinating adults is drive down community transmission rates, which will then help us with schools and children um, to try and keep the numbers low enough that they're manageable and acceptable. And we're not falling into positions of, you know, having lots of people getting really sick and, and the harms associated with COVID-19 transmission. Right. So, so I, I totally get that on a population level. But, but Dr. Barrett, I, I'm wondering, you know, as a parent, I mean, sh should we be concerned for kids in particular? I mean, especially if adults start getting... I don't know, life, life back to normal post-vaccine, they will be socializing more, they will be gathering more, and meanwhile, kids are left behind. They, they can't yet get vaccinated. Right, so we don't know exactly the answer to that question, but three really key and important points here, I think. Number one, we do recognize that in general, most children do have less severe COVID infection. Um, good thing for the individual, to your point, child, uh, but obviously, they can also then spread without knowing that they're that sick. Number two, I most certainly hope that the parents don't get back to life as usual too fast. I think it's a really important point to remember as we go forward that it's going to be well into months of vaccination before our toolbox of COVID prevention goes away and that hand washing distance masking, that shouldn't go away and it shouldn't go away too fast even when we start to vaccinate in terms of the socialization part. Mm -hmm. And so then number three, should we worry? Well, we shouldn't worry too much, but also I think this is a really important point. It really is going to depend on people who can getting vaccinated whenever their turn comes up. So it's a really great point to make that really, when vaccine comes to you, uh, very much seriously consider getting it as a protection mechanism for everyone, including kids. Right. Uh, we've got time for one more viewer question. Uh, this one's from Geetha in Vaughan, Ontario. If elementary school teachers are considered essential workers, how come they have not been prioritized to receive the vaccine? So uh, government's making hard choices, uh, but Dr. Hood, are we making the right ones? Yeah, this is a really difficult one because I think that the education system is very important to all Canadians. Um, when it comes down to what constitutes essential workers, it's really left up to the provinces and territories to decide this. Um, but the, the federal government does have some guidelines around that, and a lot of it is very much focused on those that support our critical infrastructure. There are educators included in there, those that support um, virtual learning, but, you know, it's not... Uh, completely inclusive of all teachers. So I, I'm hoping this is something that can be looked at because it is an important part of supporting our society and playing that critical social um, role to mm -hmm. have teachers available. Yeah. Dr. Hoda, Dr. Barrett, excellent speaking to you as always. Happy 2021. Thank you so much. Take care. Thanks. And we'll be right back with what could be a pivotal 48 hours south of the border. Tonight, both Trump and Biden are campaigning in Georgia ahead of a vote that could change the course of American politics. Why all the election battles have come down to this. Next. Donald Trump is still trying to overturn the November election. And a lot of Republican lawmakers back him in that. On Wednesday, Congress counts the votes. Now, normally, that's a rubber stamp process. This time, more than 150 Republicans in Congress say they plan to reject the results. It won't be enough to prevent a Biden presidency, but a GOP-led Senate can still sabotage it if they can hold on to Georgia. We've got to have Georgia hold the line. Will you do it? 
Folks, this is it. If Democrats win both Senate seats in a runoff election tomorrow, the chamber shifts to Biden. Politics in Washington may be defined by what happens in the next 48 hours. So obviously a big week in American politics. There's a lot riding on this. To help us understand it all, we have Tom Nichols here, a senior advisor at the Lincoln Project, and someone who's been called one of the leading voices of the anti-Trump right. So Tom, can you put some perspective on how much this week matters in the U.S.? It's uh, for all the marbles when it comes to the future of the Biden administration, because uh, the vote in Georgia where two Senate seats are at stake will decide who controls the U.S. Senate and therefore whether or not Mitch McConnell uh, remains the Senate majority leader. And that means um, whether or not uh, the, the new president can advance his legislative agenda, get his nominees through, get his um, appointees confirmed. So that is a really big uh, event happening where control of the U.S. Senate hinges on all of this. Uh, and then, of course, the day after, uh, there will be a vote, which normally would be a routine thing in the American system. Uh, but because the Republicans have decided to object to it, there will be a vote on accepting the outcome of the Electoral College uh, tabulation for the presidency. And it won't, it won't change anything, but it will be a, an emotional and unpleasant day, I think, for most Americans. OK, but I just want to stop you there. It, mathematically, there aren't enough Republicans to stop this. but. So if it's not going to change anything beyond the emotion of it, what does it actually matter? It, it won't matter mathematically or constitutionally because there's no indication that the Constitution allows for overturning uh, the vote. But it will convince uh, and solidify the perception among millions of Americans uh, that the election was illegitimate somehow. And it will lay the groundwork for continuing obstinacy on the part of uh, the sitting president to stay right where he is, refuse to cooperate with the incoming president-elect, um, to continue his challenges and to keep attacking the American electoral system. And I think that puts a stain on the future of the Republican Party, but um, that two-thirds of the uh, Republicans in the American House and at least a dozen senators have already committed to this, so it's going to happen. It'll be a symbolic vote, but it'll be one that's very damaging to the future of America. And beyond the, you know, the, the math of it and the symbolism, on Wednesday, as people watching from afar, is, is there a moment in particular that we should all be watching for? I think the biggest concern that I have is whether or not President Trump uh, takes to the airwaves or even comes out to the crowds in Washington and says anything that would be inflammatory or incendiary, because I think there's always a, a potential there. Um, for violence, which is something I never, as an American voter, I, I, I never really thought I would say in the wake of a pretty unremarkable um, presidential election with a clear result in the Electoral College. Um, in terms of what happens inside the chambers, uh, there will be votes. They will not numerically, they, will, they won't be able to muster a numerical um, superiority, a majority, and business will go on. Joe Biden will be certified as the next president of the United States. The real question is what Donald Trump and his supporters do in the wake of that vote. Okay. And to that point, very briefly, you know, if we get past this week, presuming we do, two weeks away then from Biden's inauguration, what do you think will determine what the Republican Party will look like after Biden's in the White House? I think the Republican Party has already chosen its fate. I think the Republican Party has determined uh, become determined to be an, a, even more of an obstructionist presence in the American government. They will never uh, accept, because they have convinced their voters not to accept, the legitimacy of a Biden presidency. But the future of the Republican Party is going to be conspiracies and um, doubts on the American system. And I think that that is both damaging to the, to the Republican Party, but also extremely damaging to the long-term health of the American Republic. Okay. All right. We're going to have to leave it there, Tom. Thank you very much for your insights. And looking ahead to tomorrow, everyone, we are convening our U.S. politics panel with David Frum and Aisha Mills to discuss the gist of Georgia's decision and what it means for the U.S. and Canada. Big day coming up. Okay. Uh, coming up in this program, a gift for the ages. As my mom, she's given me so much throughout my whole life, and it was very special to give a little, a little big something back to her that day. 
Yeah, son gives his mom a shot of immunity and a chance at a long-awaited reunion. That moment, coming up. I'm Jamie Poisson, and tomorrow on CBC's Daily News podcast, Front Burner, as outgoing President Donald Trump hammers on his baseless claims of election fraud, a pair of pivotal Senate runoffs in Georgia. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. More than 16,000 Canadians have died after contracting COVID-19. We've been bringing you some of their stories as told by their loved ones. Tonight, a son remembers his father, who died in November. My name's Eric Coe. Uh, my father, Fred Coe, died of COVID on November 28th in Richmond, BC. He was 104. A few years ago, I was driving with my dad down Beatty Street in Vancouver, and he pointed over at a parking garage and said, that's where I was born. And I looked at and I thought, well, what was the name of the hospital? And he said, I wasn't born in a hospital. I was born in a house. And that was in March 1916. And it was one of the reminders that he often gave us that he was from a different time. Um, in Toronto, he met my mother, who was a nurse at Toronto Western, and courted her by driving her home at night in a fancy Studebaker Starliner. Uh, they got married in the 50s, and then uh, he raised me and my two sisters, Allison and Kathy. Growing up, we didn't see my dad very much. He worked six days a week at the restaurant, the villa. Um, we'd see him every Sunday. We would go out for dim sum downtown with the extended family. He, he loved being with people. He had this knack for remembering names and faces and what people did. Uh, and he was always helpful. He was always there helping. Even at 100, he would be there in the kitchen cleaning up, carving the turkey for Christmas time. To his grandsons, no one, Caleb. He was Gong Gong, which is the Chinese name for grandfather on the mother's side. And for them, he was a storyteller. He told them about the family history. He told them where we came from. It's, it's strange to say that here, he's 104 years old, and I didn't expect him to go. And, and to know that he was, even though it was by video, he could hear our voices, and he, he I'm sure he knew that he was surrounded by love. Well, Fred is just one of the more than 16,000 in Canada who've now been lost to COVID-19. And we have been telling many of their stories through our interactive website. You can check it out at cbc.ca slash remembered. This is the closest Dr. Michael Gailey has been able to get to his mom in months. And what an occasion when he ended up being the one who gave her a COVID-19 vaccine. Their moment of reunion and celebration is, of course, our moment tonight. So my mom is a worker in long-term care. I'm a family physician, uh, but more than that, I work in the COVID assessment center. So I'm swabbing people uh, pretty constantly. My clinic ended up getting the call to help staff the assessment center. I asked if I could do the Friday, which is when my mom was getting vaccinated. And it was the closest that I've been to my mom throughout the whole pandemic. So it was nice to have even that physical touch of just touching her shoulder and, and doing the vaccine. And but I got to give her just a little bit of immunity in this crazy little virus that we're all uh, dealing with. It's meant a lot to be able to give that to her. I hope it gives people a bit more confidence in the vaccine. And I very much stand behind the vaccine to the point that I would give it to my own mom and her shoulder there. It was very special to give a little, a little big something back to her that day. Yeah, definitely a little big yeah. thing giving back. He, he says he feels like this was meant to be, that really, you know, somebody else was supposed to work that Friday, couldn't make it, they got the call, it just, everything fell into place. Well, and I just can't help thinking how, I mean, proud she will already have been of her son, sure. the doctor, in the midst of a pandemic, and then add this to that. Uh, that's pretty special. Very nice. That's The National for this January 4th.
Have a great night. Good night.